So uh, the goal of this presentation is to give everyone an overview of non-native fish management on the Kenai Peninsula with a focus on invasive northern pike and the use of rote known to control them. And I've included some key messages too that are useful when conveying information about rote known and non-native fish management to the public. So this slide shows eight different species of non-native fish found so far in fresh waters of the Kenai Peninsula. Northern pike were illegally introduced on the Kenai Peninsula in the 1970s, but most of the other species were discovered since the year 2000. Blackfish, which are native to parts of Alaska but not here, have been known to exist in some Kenai River drainages since the 1990s. Of all these species shown, only blackfish and northern pike are known to still remain. So yeah, everything from crayfish to muskies have shown up unexpectedly here. So what are the concerns with non-native fish? And the big one is species like northern pike that can prey directly on native fish, or they could have competition impacts to native fish going after the same food sources. There's always the risk of introducing a novel disease to the area. Um, Non-native fish are known to not only change the food webs, the lake ecology, we've had water quality uh, changes in some of the lakes where native fish have been introduced. And they certainly have the ability, at least some species, to impact other animals through predation, like for pike, for instance, frogs, birds, invertebrates, that sort of thing. So northern pike are the largest invasive fish threat in south central Alaska. Um, there's a picture of one gobbling up a rainbow trout right there. Pike prefer shallow, low flow vegetated habitat. In those habitats, they have the ability to dominate the fish assemblage and usually they do reduce or completely eliminate all other native fish species, particularly soft rayed fish like juvenile salmon and trout, um, where there's a lot of habitat utilization overlap. So species that might rear in shallow vegetated waters are very vulnerable to being highly impacted by pike. Uh, even when other prey are more abundant, soft fin fish are preferred by pike and they are often the first to disappear. So how bad is this problem? Um, it would take a long time for me to read through the list of the different South Central Alaska waters where pike have had a, a negative impact. On the Kenai Peninsula, pike have completely eliminated all native fish species from over a dozen lakes. There are multiple sockeye rearing lakes in the Susitna drainage that no longer support any sockeye production after being invaded by pike. Um, a classic example of pike impacts is the popular Alexander Creek king fishery that was very popular for decades and it collapsed after invasive pike uh, became established throughout the, the whole drainage. Um, and here closer to home, we nearly lost the unique Arctic char population in Stormy Lake up by Nikiski, which produced the largest char on the Kenai Peninsula, fish up to 10 pounds due to pike that were introduced. Um, so pike are expected to, dramatic, to, to dramatically alter fish assemblages in South Central Alaska wherever favorable habitat for them is prevalent. So if there's a lot of shallow vegetated waters, which serves as good pike habitat, we could expect pretty severe changes to the native fish assemblage. Um, so this slide shows the distribution of pike roughly now in South Central Alaska. And all those red squiggly lines are where pike are known to exist in the Susitna River drainage, which is clearly the most heavily impacted. Um, I should state that pike are native north and west of the Alaska range and through much of North America. But uh, thousands of years ago when pike pioneered Alaska, they never got over the Alaska range in the ice fields. So for thousands of years, South Central Alaska has not had pike until they were illegally introduced in the 1950s up in the Susitna drainage. Um, so definitely the Susitna drainage has been hit hardest, but there's also pike populations to be found in the Anchorage Bowl and down here on the Kenai. The current status of northern pike on the Kenai is, uh, well, this slide shows lots of 
uh, water bodies that are black, those are all water bodies where we've had pike and they're no longer present. And we got rid of most of those through rote known treatments, but some smaller lakes we've actually succeeded with gill nets. If you notice on the right side of this slide, there's a couple of red lakes. Those are lakes where pike are still present, where actually we recently discovered them up in the Miller Creek drainage, just south of Point Possession, the very northern tip of the Kenai, and that is the last known remaining pike population on the Kenai Peninsula. And unfortunately, we have evidence showing that the pike crossed Cook Inlet from the Susitna drainage to get there. Long story, but there's um, evidence through microchemistry of the, the bones in the pike, which you can kind of trace their life history out. So that was, uh, that's kind of scary that pike do tolerate brackish water and, and can move around Cook Inlet to some degree. So there's a lot of ongoing and future work planned for invasive pike, including studying pike physiology. There's a grad student sponsored by the Fish and Wildlife Service that's gonna be looking at that, including the jumping ability of pike. Next year, Fish and Game's gonna be doing a, a small study to examine the saltwater tolerance of northern pike, different life stages. Um, there's this um, invasive pike committee, part of ACISP, ACISP which is developing a new pike management plan to replace the current plan, just to update it. Which is Chrissy Dunker, the Fish and Game Regional Coordinator, spearheading that. It's just a really impressive project. I think it's going to be awesome when it's done. Lots of pike monitoring and suppression projects going on, done by Fish and Game and uh, uh, Native Corporations, Cook Inlet Aquaculture, Kenai Watershed Forum. I don't know if I need to read through this whole list, but there's a lot of stuff going on from genetics work on pike, continuing to do select rote known treatments. We've got university involvement. Um, there's a Deshka River Pike and Diet Habitat study by UAA, uh, pike um, otolith microchemistry analysis work that's being done out of the Fairbanks University and uh, University of Alaska Anchorage has been great. They process water samples looking at rote known content for us and they've been doing some studies looking at the factors that affect rote known attenuation, how quickly rote known degrades and what, what some of the biotic and abiotic factors are that lead to that. And the big thing locally here is this new pike discovery in the Miller Creek drainage, which we're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Kenai Watershed Forum to address. So that was a lot. Um, so I've been talking about rote known. What the heck is it? It's an extract of the tropical bean family. It's uh, plants that are tropical in the bean plant family. It can be ground up or sometimes extracted from the plants. It's been used for thousands of years by indigenous people in tropical areas to, to, Im, to uh, immobilize fish and collect it for food. Uh, it's been used for 90 years in the US for fish management. It's really absorbed quickly through membranes of gills. So it works sort of specifically to gilled organisms and it acts by preventing preventing or inhibiting cellular respiration specifically, a fish isn't able to utilize the oxygen in their blood. Uh, Rotenone is available in both liquid and powdered products. Here's a couple of pictures. The powdered product is just that. It looks like almost like cooking flour. It's ground up plant material. CFT legumens, one of several rotenone formulations that are liquefied and um, there's additives put it uh, added to it, I guess, to help it disperse and distribute better through the water column. Um, Rotenone is a restricted use pesticide. It can only be applied by the under the supervision of a certified applicator. In Alaska, that'd be a certified aquatic applicator. And certified applicators Applicators are strongly encouraged to attend a four and a half day training course through the American Fishery Society titled Planning and Executing Successful Rote Known and Antimycin, product, Antimycin Products. Sorry. Um, really good training. Um, if anybody ever has to use Rote Known, highly recommend it. And I don't know how common this is for other restricted use pesticides, but besides the labeling that comes with the uh, rotenone containers, there's an SLP manual, which is considered legally part of the labeling for rotenone products. 
And I refer to the manual as the Rote Known Bible, and it covers everything on planning and conducting and monitoring Rote Known treatments. Um, currently, the EPA is re-registering Rote Known products, which they do for all pesticides every 15 years. And there's going to be new labeling that results from that and likely a new, some revisions done to this manual. The manual is available free online through the AFS, American Fishery Society, Rote Known Stewardship Program. There's the link below. And it's a pretty neat website. It, it, it's been revised recently and there's just a ton of information for all things Rote Known, including a forum where you can ask experts for advice. So again, I don't know how many other pesticides have that sort of setup backing them, but it, for Rote Known, it's been really useful for me. Um, so without boring you with details, there is a lot of required training for rote known applicators and those working under their su supervision before they can go out and do a treatment. It's all detailed in that SLP manual I talked about. And typically when we have a crew and we're going to go treat a lake, it takes about a half a day to cover all the safety training. Um, you can see the list there of all the things we discuss, And that doesn't include going out and practicing with the application equipment and putting on PPE and making sure everything fits right or getting the fit and medical testing for wearing a respirator. So there's a lot involved there. Most of the time when we're doing rote known treatments to get rid of non-native fish, um, we're applying from boats, semi-closed pump systems and boats, but we've also used here on the Kenai uh, a helicopter once and we're likely to do it again here in the new future to apply, particularly in big, submerged wetland areas. And we also use battery powered drip stations. That's the, a drip station shown at the top of that slide on the kind of right side. And then of course, backpack spraying, kind of spot treating problem areas. Um, so we always monitor the rote known concentration in the water after we treat. Um, and what we found is it degrades really fast here in Alaska with our in the summertime with sunlight and warm temperatures. It, the half-life can be sometimes hours or days. Uh, often it's gone in seven to 10 days, completely undetectable in lakes in warm water treatments, but in the cold, it can last for months. So we've had one treatment where it lasted nine months, basically from October till through June the next year. Sunlight and heat are the primary natural degradation forces on it. What's nice about rotenone, it doesn't penetrate far through soil, just a few inches. It binds to organics really strongly. It doesn't bioaccumulate like some pesticides in, in the food web. It's never been documented to uh, occur in groundwater from fisheries applications. And it breaks down ultimately, given enough time into water and carbon dioxide. Hey, um, two minutes. Oh, I'm gonna have to fly here, hang on. So how safe <laughs> is this? Uh, Usually we treat at about 40 parts per billion. The EPA says you can drink that and certainly swim in it. The biggest risk is the applicators. It doesn't cause cancer. Um, there's some literature where uh, it's been linked to Parkinson's-like symptoms, but usually that's through the medical community that uses rotenone to um, solicit rotenone-like symptoms for studying. And it um, there's really not any known proven connection between rotenone use in fisheries management and Parkinson's disease, just wanna say that. It can affect um, any gill-breathing organisms, including like zooplankton in the water. Uh, it's not absorbed through the skin and uh, digestive tract very well. Uh, I won't say much of this, but that's the list of the typical permits and authorizations that you need before we go go out and do a rote known treatment. So it's it's a lot. You just don't go out and decide we're gonna do a rote known treatment. And here's some key messages with the public I often share. If you find yourself in a conversation with people about what we're doing with non-native you know non -native fish control and rote known, one of the messages I share is um, it's Fish and Game's responsibility to conserve and protect the fisheries. That's why we're, we're doing this. Rote known sometimes is the only effective tool to eradicate fish. That's why we're using it. And rote known poses no health risk if there's no exposure. And we can virtually eliminate exposure risk based on protecting our applicators and treatment timing and closing lakes temporarily during the treatment. And we always introduce the native fish. That's what the whole point of this is about.
Um, that's picture some stormy lake Arctic char. We've had really good success with our native fish restorations. Usually it involves collecting native fish, what's left of them beforehand, putting them in a safe area and moving them back in after the rote known has gone and the invasive fish are gone. And what can you do to help? Man, if you catch or see a pike on the Kenai, call this number, 1877 invasive Report anybody moving live fish around without a permit. Finally, for the first time this last year, well, about a year ago, that did happen in Alaska. So maybe the message is getting out. It's a big no-no. And I mentioned this project up by Point Possession and Miller Creek Drainage. Uh, there's an environmental assessment that's going on for that. The public commenting period is going on. And if you want to comment on that, this is a link. It's through the Fish and Game website. The Fish and Wildlife Service also has it posted and you can learn more about it and comment on the project. The deadline is the 17th of this month. And there you go. Hopefully I didn't go too far over board. Uh, perfect. Um, great. So I think I'll pass this on over to Christina for, um, for questions. Okay, we have a number of questions here in the chat. So the first one from Paul Bennett's, um, what salinity of water can pike survive and, and for how long? So most of the literature comes from Europe, Baltic Sea area, where they can live out their whole life history in 10 parts per thousand. Um, some tests that have been done, the, uh, adult larger pike can it take uh, periods of up I don't know how long, but it's not clear in the literature, but um, salinity up to about 13, 15 parts per thousand. That's the salinity that you could find up in the northern part of Cook Inlet. It will approach double that salinity as you move further south, like towards Kenai and certainly down by Homer. Um, occasionally, pike do get reported caught in commercial set nets, particularly on the west side and up around the Susitna. Um, and we're hoping some of the studies that we do on salinity tolerance here in next year kind of gives us some survival times for pike at, at different salinity gradients. Great. Um, Patrick Houlihan asks, what are the rote known impacts on non-target non fish, Sam, you know, for example, salmon? Yep. So that's the thing with rote known. It's, it's non-specific. It's going to clean out usually all the fish that are exposed to it. So that's why we bend over backwards to um, come up with a native fish restoration plan. For Soldotna Creek, for instance, we treated that with rote known in 2016. We ended up collecting and moving 95,000 fish out of that creek. Um, that's not always an option to get that amount of fish, but we always try to get representative fish and time it so we're um, missing adult salmon runs, we're letting the smolt escape, so we're kind of minimizing age classes that might get affected by, at least for salmon. But that's, yeah, it's a, it's a tool that, um, it's a big hammer. We don't like using it, but sometimes it's the only thing that we have. I think you kind of answered um, Tim Miller's question, can rote known be used selectively at all or are all fish equally susceptible to the product? Probably not in Alaska because the species that we have here, the native species and non-native species um, tend not to be really tolerant of rote known. There are parts of the country where there's rote known tolerant species that's often called rough fish like bullheads and stuff where you, there are, you can hit it with a lower concentration of rote known to target some species but maybe some of these more tolerant species would survive. But we've not had any success with that here. I, I will say um, like eggs are pretty, fish eggs are pretty tolerant of rote known. Uh, Nicole Aravallo asks, will it wipe out all of the gill breathing organisms in a water body? And if so, does ADF and G try, just try to restock with all the native species taken from a uh, nearby body, water bodies? So when you talk gilled organisms, that could be fish, it could be different uh, gilled invertebrates, uh, freshwater mussels, this and that. So things like snails and uh, freshwater mussels tend to be 50 to 100 times more tolerant. Um, the studies we do collecting the organisms, you know, assessing what is present before and after treatment, 
most of the invertebrates, um, zooplankton, things like that, aren't affected much. Um, I will say leeches, aquatic worms, and I, I mentioned zooplankton. Actually, some species of zooplankton get hit pretty hard. What we do see is give it one to two years and the uh, invertebrate assemblage uh, tends to rebound completely. Uh, we, there was a great study done decades ago up in the valley where they looked at zooplankton in particular because they tend, those species tend to collapse pretty hard after rotenone treatment. And um, the result of that study is no, no zooplankton species were lost. And usually there was a complete recovery between one and three years. Zooplankton are really important fish food for like juvenile trout and salmon. Um, so you, if you're going to have juvenile salmon back immediately, you might want to consider that you have enough zooplankton there to support them. Kind of to follow up on that question, you know, do you, do you reintroduce through dumping water from another lake into it? you know, back so, into it afterwards? Yeah, we, we don't have to for invertebrates. Uh, a lot of the macro invertebrates and zooplankton's, they have various life stages that um, protect them from rotenone. A lot of our treatments are done in the fall and a lot of these uh, invertebrates go into cyst stages and dormant stages. Um, and a lot of the bigger invertebrates that you might see like water beetles and dragonfly naiads, uh, they tend to just act like nothing happened. They're there when the rotenone's fully at full strength and they seem unaffected by it. And we don't see any changes to those macro invertebrates for the most part. It's really fish disappear. Uh, some species of zooplankton might be limited for a year or two. And then leeches and aquatic worms will see those often die. But when we go back and sample a year later, they're there. So um, there seems to be a lot of resiliency and life stages that help them carry over, even though the more mature life forms tend to be uh, killed off. Uh, we were curious about wood frogs. Um, I can tell you at Scout Lake, we treated that in 2009 and even I was surprised because uh, gilled amphibians like tadpoles are often, at least in the literature, susceptible to rotenone. And um, the lake was still hot enough that it was killing fish from a fall treatment. It was still hot a little bit at ice out in the spring, but I was catching live tadpoles in, uh, in the minnow traps, even though uh, test fish were dying. So the, it seems like our local wood frogs, at least in that situation, tolerate it very well. And I will say most of the time when we're going after invasive pike, a lot of times the wood frog population has collapsed and a lot of the residents in the area tell us after we treat, suddenly in the spring, they have their wood frogs back within a year or two because pike eat frogs. So that's been our experience. That's interesting. Um, we have some more questions here. Um, Heather asks, how many treatments and how long does it take before a lake is declared eradicated? So yeah, we, when we treat a lake, we just don't walk away and like our job's done. We usually have to rely on gill netting effort and a lot of it to give us confidence that the treatment worked. And we've got little calculations we can do based on the catch efficiency of our nets and pike. And, but usually what we do in a fall treatment is we will put nets in, under the ice and let them fish all winter. And we pull them in the spring if they're fish free. That tells us we probably did a good job of get rid of, getting rid of the invasive fish. So far, that's always been the case. And of course, the fish can rot out of a net under the winter. And so we did a little mini study looking at that. And usually, like a pike anyways, is going to hang in a gill net and be identifiable, identifiable for about 50 days under the ice. So when the ice goes off the lake, we pull a single gill net out. That represents to us about 50 days of netting effort at that location. And we'll put multiple nets in a lake. So we have a pretty good handle on whether treatment worked or not. We also can use caged fish. We put them in a lake, we call them sentinel fish to tell us if we treated effectively in all areas. And we have used eDNA sampling to tell us um, 
if there's pike DNA in the water, that can be a little confusing because sometimes we found the pike DNA can persist for years, even after the pike are gone. It can get preserved in the sediment and get stirred up from high water events and winds and stuff like that. Wow, interesting. Um, Paul Bennett asks, um, how long after eradication do you wait for restocking and to allow for invertebrate populations to reestablish? And I think you talked about that a little bit, but. Because we're not rarely introducing fry young of the year fish, we're introducing native fish that are fingerling size to catchable adult size, and they're not feeding on zooplankton. We're usually not concerned about is there going to be enough food because these bigger fish are eating like macro invertebrates and bigger things that don't seem to be affected much by the route known. So almost always within a year of treatment, we've brought the native fish back to the lakes. And we're, we've not seen any issue. We actually, we've seen really good growth rates. When you treat a lake and kill a lot of fish, some of those fish sink, and then there's a fertilizer effect to the lake. And it can cause plankton blooms and some invertebrate blooms population explosions. We've seen some lakes just explode with freshwater shrimp, for instance, afterwards. It might not be sustained, but usually there's lots of fish food and we can put fish in within a year or less sometimes. Okay, uh, Matt Bowser made a comment, Alaska blackfish can tolerate rotenone better than other AK fish. Yes, we found that out like a decade ago up in Anchorage when there was Cheney Lake that was had a big pike problem and there was also illegally introduced blackfish into it. And even though everything looked dead pike wise, we had lots of blackfish up around the lake surface gulping and they survived. So yeah, they're, I guess they are one of the few species that's found in Alaska and even on the Kenai that probably wouldn't be a great candidate for rote known treatment to try to get rid of them. Blackfish are similar to pike. They're native through much of interior and northern Alaska, but they were never established south of the Alaska range here either. And they have been introduced to some areas in South Central Alaska, including some little tributaries near Kenai. And it's, I guess the verdict's still out how invasive they may be, but there is some evidence that where blackfish show up, um, they may be out competing like coho salmon juveniles. Visit keneyinvasives.org to learn more.